Did you ever wonder why birds have beaks? How do you think you would eat with no hands and no teeth? In this lecture, we're going to dive into the science of ornithology, the study of birds by exploring bird feeding adaptations. We'll cover bird beaks and sometimes feet as they relate to feeding adaptations, what different birds eat, and how we can help birds thrive on our planet. There are about 50 million active birders in the United States today, and many more around the world. Watching birds in our own backyards is one of the most popular kinds of birding, according to 2011 U.S. citizen surveys. Many backyard birders live in urban areas where parks and feeders help birds survive lengthy migrations and long winters. Among the most popular birds to watch are ducks and geese. They can commonly be seen dabbling in ponds and streams, flying from one park to another, and floating with other waterfowl. It's becoming easier to find hawks, eagles, and pelicans, too. These species have made a great comeback since pesticides like DDT were banned in the 1970s. These birds are easy to spot since they roost along roads and soar high in the sky, searching for rodents and other prey. Then. There are many common seed-eating birds. We enjoy watching finches, cardinals, chickadees, and sparrows as they flit around our backyard feeders. We are so keen to watch birds that we spend lots of money to do so. We fill bird feeders. We build bird houses. We buy binoculars, birding books, and apps that help us identify birds. Some of us even travel long distances to watch birds and some bird watchers even compete informally in a year-long bird observing exercise over a local geographic area, a competition described in the book and movie, The Big Year. Would you believe that in 2011, people in the United States alone spent more than $40 billion watching birds? Birding generated more than 600,000 jobs and billions of dollars in federal and state taxes. Birding is not only fun, it's big business, and it shows how many of us love birds. If you're a bird watcher, you already know some of the reasons these creatures are so fascinating. If you aren't, you may be wondering, what's the big deal about birds? For many people, the fascination is in their appearance. Birds are the only animals on Earth with feathers, which is what makes them a bird. The variety of birds, from the world's tiniest bird, the bee hummingbird, weighing just one fifteenth of an ounce, to the largest bird on Earth, the ostrich, weighing up to 350 pounds, is truly amazing. Other people are fascinated by the wonders of bird courtship, reproduction, nests, and eggs. Bird adaptations are incredible, and we'll talk about them later. But first, let's talk about one of the most amazing adaptations of a bird that's visible to the human eye, the bill. Bill and beak are synonymous words. Bird bills evolved over 85 million years ago, resulting in the wide variety of shapes seen today. The many bill shapes are adaptations to the many habitats birds live in and niches in which they feed. Despite their huge diversity of shapes, lengths, and even color, all beaks have an underlying bony structure consisting of an upper and lower mandible. These bony structures are covered by keratin derived from epidermal cells to form the fine structure of the beak. If you look closely, there are holes somewhere in the beak structure, usually at the base, and these external nares connect to the respiratory system. These structures first evolved in the dinosaur ancestors of birds over 140 million years ago, and since then there has been an incredible radiation into modern beak forms over 85 million years. Look at the beak of a duck. 
Its spatula-like shape helps birds like ducks and geese eat vegetation and small invertebrates. Imagine a duck diving down into the water and grabbing a mouthful of pond bottom with its beak. If we were to look just inside these beaks, we would find small toothpick-like projections called lamellae. Just like a spaghetti strainer filters out water and leaves spaghetti behind, these lamellae act like strainers. They filter out mud, water, and other underwater stuff the duck doesn't want to eat. These strainers are very necessary since waterfowl and other birds do not chew their food. And the strainer-like lamellae can help them keep foods like small plants, seeds, and bugs in their beaks to swallow. Flamingos are also filter feeders, and several of the six flamingo species have large lamellae which allow them to filter large invertebrates like shrimp, while others have small lamellae that can strain out water while keeping very small algae in their beaks. Flamingos feed with their heads down and beaks upside down in the water. So unlike beaks in other birds, the lower flamingo bill is the larger one, and the upper bill is the smaller part of the beak structure. Part of the flamingo's filter feeding is accomplished by swinging the beak back and forth through the water. And when the beak is fairly full, the rest of the filter feeding is accomp accomplished by a strong tongue forcing water out through the beak's amazing system of lamellae. Some waterfowl, like mallards, are adapted for dabbling style feeding. They just tip their tails up and heads down and feed near the bottom in the shallows. Their bills are rounded with a little hook on the end that they use to move unwanted items aside, much like how we might use our fingernail to move food. Other ducks, like the colorful North American wood ducks, have different shaped bills that are adapted for feeding on acorns and other tree nuts that are common in the flooded woodlands where they live. Geese and swans have long necks and can feed in deeper water, often on grasses of river bottoms. And then there are diving ducks, like the mergansers. They have streamlined bodies, and their feet are set far back to make for easy swimming underwater. Their narrow beaks are designed to grab small fish. Whether the beaks of waterfowl and flamingos are like spaghetti strainers, filtering out preferred foods from a watery solution, or like tongs that easily grasp fish and other prey. These bird beaks are amazing adaptations for specialized feeding and watering niches. All birds of prey, collectively called raptors, have powerful, strongly hooked beaks for ripping and tearing meat in a predatory niche. Hawks, eagles, falcons, and owls all fall into this raptor group. Their beaks are sized relative to their body and also have diet-adapted shapes. You'll find small beaks on small falcons and owls whose prey is relatively small. And you'll find large beaks on eagles, vultures, and great horned owls, which eat larger prey. Most raptors have sharp talons or claws that are used to grip and kill prey. Raptors use their sharp beaks like we use knives cutting meat into pieces that are easy to swallow. Different species of raptors eat different prey. However, they all help humans by eating animals that we consider to be pests. American kestrels eat small mice and large insects like locusts, while hawks in urban areas eat pigeons and rats. Enormous eagles may eat more interesting prey like small deer, primates, or large fish. Our supreme owl in North America the great horned owl has an incredible grip. I once raised a young great horned owl that was orphaned after its mother was hit by a car. Several years later, I was feeding him and he grabbed my thick handling glove with one foot and sank his talons right through. Owl talons are amazingly strong, as are the beaks of vultures. Vultures are supreme cleaners of our environment. Have you ever driven along the roadside and noticed a road-killed animal one day that disappeared the next? Turkey vultures, black vultures, and the largest of vultures, indeed, the largest of all raptors, the condors, will consume carcasses as large as big deer until there's nothing left. In some instances, they'll even consume the bones. I've watched the same behaviors in Africa. 
Several species of vultures competed with a female cheetah and her cubs over a gazelle that the cheetahs killed. While the cheetahs ate, a large group of vultures swarmed closer and closer. Ultimately, the cheetah ran off. Five minutes later, not much was left of the gazelle carcass. Dozens of vultures consumed the remainder of it and wiped the environment clean of most traces that the gazelle body was ever there. Some ate the skin, some the leftover meat, and some of the larger vultures with larger beaks even ate the bones. Vultures have bare heads to keep their feathers clean while they're plunging into the body cavity, going after the guts and bones they thrive on. Once, I had to handle an adult king vulture, a new world species of vulture. Based on my previous experience with the owl, I paid close attention to the bird's feet. However, the feet aren't the business end of a new world vulture, its beak is. The vulture bit through the tough leather handling glove with even more force than the owl's talons. No wonder some of them can eat tough skin and bones. Raptors are at the top of the food chain, having evolved into a niche available for carnivorous flying hunters. They have evolved these amazing adaptations of gripping talons and tearing beaks because of the advantage they confer for hunting. And they have physiological adaptations that complement their anatomical adaptations. For instance, vultures have a highly acidic digestive tract that enables them to digest old carrion meat as well as neutralize the bacteria that old meat may be harboring. Where would our world be without the raptors? We would have many more mice, rats, and other pests without hawks and owls. And we would have a lot more dead bodies lying around the environment without raptorial birds of all sizes. Some of the birds we observe around backyard bird feeders have much more subtle but still amazing adaptations to take advantage of the food sources in their particular niche. Seed eaters, for example, have tiny beaks that act like nutcrackers. Different beaks are shaped for different seeds. For instance, goldfinches are specialized to reach the smallest of seeds from teasels and thistles. They can do so without poking their eyes with the sharp, protective projections on these plants. Large finches and cardinals eat larger seeds from different plants within the same regional environments. Crossbills have, as their name suggests, crossed bills. They may look strange, but these beaks are the tools that allow crossbills to pry open pine cones to get to the nutritious nuts that lie within. Small seed-eating birds have feet that allow the birds to perch atop tiny branches of the plants where they find their food. And some feet, like the feet of a nuthatch, allow birds to walk straight up and down tree trunks to get to the seeds and insects they want to eat. Of all birds, parrots have some of the most dynamic beaks. Within their large beaks are mobile tongues, which help parrots manipulate their food. Some birds in the parrot family, like the lorikeets and lorries of Australasia region, have brush-tipped tongues that help them drink nectar and eat soft, juicy fruits. Other parrots and their macaw relatives use their huge hooked beaks like nutcrackers to open varieties of tree nuts. Macaw's beaks are so powerful that they can even open large hard nuts like Brazil nuts. And the parrots have another advantage associated with their mouths. The large muscular tongue helps some species mimic human speech and other sounds. No wonder we humans relate so well to parrots. The early bird gets the worm, and the robin is no exception. You've probably watched robins hop around the yard looking for worms, and maybe cocking their heads as if they're listening for worms. Or have you wondered if they're smelling the worms? Or watching for worm movements? Or simply feeling the worm's movements underfoot? Scientists have studied robins